He was the Libertarian Party candidate for President of the United States in uh, 1988. And Dr. Paul is a practicing physician, and he previously served from 1976 to 1960 to 84 as a Republican member of the U.S. House of Representatives, and uh, was a continual thorn in their side at that time. And uh, will obviously have things to say about uh, the influence he, he was able to have while in the House. He's a, a strong advocate of hard money. And he was instrumental in, uh, in persuading the U.S. Treasury to, to issue, to res resume the minting of, of gold coins. He was responsible, <laughs> indeed. <laughs> and he is founder of the Foundation for Rational Economics and Education, FREE, the acronym is FREE, in Houston, Texas. And it gives me a great deal of pleasure to introduce Dr. Ron Paul. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'll quit while I'm ahead. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Uh, it's real nice to be here, and I appreciate the invitation to come. Uh, Jim Perrin extended the invitation personally, and I uh, and I'm delighted to be here. Uh, before I get started in my remarks, I would like to uh, recognize some good work by uh, Tony Nathan, who has been working with the uh, public relations. Uh, she, had, she heard the other day that I was going to Washington to do a little bit of filming for my television program at the end of the month and uh, did get me on to uh, C-SPAN for a 45-minute call-in program on libertarian ideas. So uh, you might look for that, and that's going to be helpful. C-SPAN, you know, uh, has been very uh, uh, fair to the libertarians. They were very fair, uh, certainly during the campaign. Somebody once told me that uh, if only the viewers of C-SPAN voted, I would have done a lot better in 1988. <laughs> But uh, unfortunately, a lot of people listen to the three majors still, and that makes it a little more difficult for us to get our views out. But uh, certainly it is important learning from our mistakes and learning from what we do right and learning from those who have been involved in the political arena on how to sell political ideas, the libertarian message, to get average America to endorse what we believe in. Uh, it's great to be philosophic and academic and precise and right all the time. And uh, yet, if we don't do more to present our views in a way that it's palatable to the American public, where it's not offensive, uh, really the views won't amount to much because it will be held by a narrow group. So I've dedicated a lot of my time and energy over the last couple decades to trying to take libertarian views and making them so that the average person accepts them without thinking that they're accepting anything un unusual. But that at times uh, uh, can be uh, quite, quite a challenge. Um, during the campaign of 1988, there was one episode that certainly uh, encouraged me. There were a lot of events that were exciting, um, but uh, the uh, time that we met at uh, Faneuil Hall in Boston was certainly one that I remember very clearly. The part that uh, I generally don't want to remember is, uh, you know, the uh, precise number of votes that we got. But, um, you know, uh, if, if you analyze it c carefully, uh, there's no reason to be uh, totally negative about that either because um, uh, James uh, uh, Buchanan uh, uh, quoted me as saying that uh, – uh, Kilpatrick, I'm sorry, Kilpatrick quoted me as saying that if we took all the people who endorsed the Libertarian Party view and all those who rejected the Republicans and the Democrats were in the large majority. So there are a lot of people who have now rejected the conventional politics and the conventional wisdom of Washington and Republicans and Democrats. And we certainly have to build on that because uh, we have an answer. It's just that we have not been successful in delivering the, this message to the American people in a uh, broad uh, manner. 
But the time when uh, we had our meeting in Washington, thanks to the wonderful activity of a libertarian friend, Gene Burns, on the radio station in Boston, we were able to fill Faneuil Hall. Now, Faneuil Hall is not gigantic, but it's big enough to hold uh, hundreds of people. And the hall was filled, and there was a balcony that was filled, and there was standing room only, and there was a lot of television. But the significance uh, to me was what was important. Because Faneuil Hall, of course, was the place where uh, many before the Declaration of Independence met and talked about uh, the problems the colonists were facing. And it was led by uh, Samuel Adams, who was not meek in what he believed and, and uh, what he advocated. But uh, it was a great night because there were no holds barred. Uh, even, even when we would say things like ban the IRS uh, and ban the income tax and ban the Federal Reserve System and a lot of other things, this crowd went wild. So it was very, very encouraging. But the most interesting thing occurred afterwards because as we were going out, one of my staff people were talking, was talking to the uh, administrator or the caretaker of the building. And he had taken care of this building for a long time. And he said, uh, boy, he says, this was great. He says, it was about time we had somebody in this building sound like Sam Adams. <laughs> I was first introduced uh, to the ideas of libertarianism in the 1960s. Uh, I believe very sincerely I was born a natural libertarian. Then I went to public schools and something happened. But by the 1960s, I had to re-educate myself, cancel out many of the ideas pumped into my head by the media and by the schools, and finally I again arrived at a position which is called libertarianism, and as the 60s passed through with the influence of uh, the war in Vietnam and, uh, and some of the economic conditions building, it was by the end of the 60s that uh, it was clear to me uh, what the philosophy ought to be to offer an alternative to what we had uh, and have in this country. In 1974, I first ran for Congress. That was my first uh, race for Congress. I was first elected in 76. I left Congress at the end of 1984. So there was a span there of approximately 10 years of running regularly for office. During those campaigns, I did endorse entirely the libertarian philosophy. Of course, even within this room, there may be some disagreements on the preciseness of that definition, but nevertheless, for general purposes, I endorsed the philosophy and was capable of, uh, of winning elections and not having opponents even the last time by taking the positions that I, ha that I take now, including that on drugs in a Bible Belt area. But uh, they actually became non-events as the people got to know me, realizing that my drug position was a very sincere position, that as a physician and as a parent, I was very unconcerned personally about promoting drugs, since uh, they were very much aware of my criticism of drug usage. But nevertheless, I was able to take that and uh, present these views, and I was able to, uh, to be elected. Now, in Washington, it was interesting to see the transition that went on. In 1976, when I was first elected, uh, I, was, I was elected in a special election that uh, the Republican Party and uh, uh, a lot of the supporters and certainly the members of Congress saw me coming in as a conservative Republican. And, of course, the first week or so, there was a B-1 bomber vote that came up and a few other civil liberties votes that all of a sudden, they looked at me and they said, what in thunder's going on here? And they were really disturbed and provoked and annoyed, and uh, they just couldn't understand uh, how I could be voting uh, for some of these uh, measures. It got easier as time went on. Uh, the... Um, the Congress itself, as the nation, became more aware of the Libertarian Party and the Libertarian message. I think my identity was uh, more strongly uh, uh, associated with the Libertarian Party after I put the uh, 1980 party principles in the congressional record. And uh, that, uh, that then sort of opened up more dialogue and more debate with the other members of Congress. 
Some uh, people would say, well, wasn't it awful lonely? Were you the only one there? You're the only one that endorsed these views. It must have been total, total chaos and, and, uh, and a real problem. Well, to some degree that is, but if you look at it in the other way, you have something you can agree with everybody there. You can agree with the liberals on some issues and the conservatives on some issues. And for that ra reason, rather than it being a negative, I thought it turned out to be a positive. It also uh, uh, afforded some benefits, too. There were some times when Republicans and Democrats couldn't even find uh, an endorsement of anything that we were saying, and then the vote would turn out to be 430 to 1. Now, you... <laughs> Now you would think that if you're voting by yourself and there's one vote, it makes no difference. Who cares? You're, you're one person. But you know your, your vote as an individual, as one person, was much more valuable because the media would say, hey, why did you do this? Well, I mean, I mean, it narrowed it down. They had to ask me why I did it. <laughs> so there, there, were some, there were some benefits, and it, was, uh, it also uh, allowed, I, in a way, I saw, it, I, thought, I saw it as some fun because you got to play, uh, play this game, realizing that you were not, if you recognize you're not going to change the world and you're in that situation, then it's not so bad. If you go as a libertarian to Washington and think you're going to make Congress libertarian, you might as well forget it. You won't sleep at night very well because you'll be very frustrated and not much will happen. If anything, more happened than I thought would because there were some pieces of legislation that uh, nobody cared about by a, little bit, by a little bit of effort. I was able to point some things out and bring people together and oppose certain legislation. Certainly the bill that uh, eventually in, uh, evolved into the gold coin uh, was something that I would have never dreamed of in 1974 or 76 that we could convene a gold conference. Of course, the headline on in the Washington Post after the conve after the conference was uh, the gold con uh, the gold conference uh, uh, the gold commission has rejected the gold standard. Well, I didn't think that was so much news as much as the fact that we had a discussion, which was something that we haven't had for a good many years. So there were a um, a lot of a lot of positives. During the campaign in 1980, the media frequently would, you know, come and say, well, fine, you're running as a libertarian. There are no libertarians in Congress. What would happen if you became president? Wouldn't this be total disaster? Because there would be no help and assistance and you would be opposed by everybody. And yet my answer was the same. That, you know, a libertarian president might do quite well, even under today's circumstances. If you go to the liberals and get their support on civil liberties and go to the liberals and maybe Maybe uh, get some more reasonable approach to foreign policy. This you could build a coalition, and you should, certainly could build a coalition with conservatives to cut back on some of the welfare spending. So even though this is very unlikely, you won't have a libertarian president till you have not only a libertarian Congress but a libertarian consensus among the people. So ultimately, it's the changing of people's views points that really counts, so that the Congress reflects those viewpoints, and then, of course, endorse the uh, the president. But even theoretically, under today's circumstances, a libertarian president could do a lot better job than those guys are doing up there right now. And talking about jobs uh, by our administration, I want to very briefly make a comment because we had a press conference this morning. We had a television uh, station show up, thanks to Tony, and we talked about uh, the uh, Persian Gulf in Iraq. And um, I, I, I see this as very dangerous. Uh, I um, made a comment in my weekly or my monthly report this uh, coming month that actually events are moving more rapidly than I had once thought, and I'm considered one who's waving flags and warning and saying that we're on a course of financial disaster and we're on a course of, uh, of uh, political uh, chaos in this country unless we change our ways. Well, when I saw reports on the weekend that uh, 250,000 troops may end up in Saudi Arabia, that we are imposing illegal uh, 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 boycotts or uh, on on the Iraq nation when we still have 3,000 Americans behind those lines. I mean, we're looking for a lot of trouble. And then seeing the large hospital ship with 1,000 beds on them moving out to the uh, Persian Gulf, I think things are moving rather rapidly when just a few months ago we were concentrating on the breaking up of the Soviet Empire and the uh, need 
need to cut way back on the military. But now we see an orchestrated effort to build up the military again in several major programs, and including Ted Koppel's program to justify the need for more CIA activity around the world rather than the opposite of saying we need less of that. So we, we do live in perilous time. We live in exciting times and we see things changing behind the Iron Curtain, the disintegration of the Iron Curtain, but until man becomes perfect, we are going to have many of these problems and we're certainly going to face them. And unless we clean our own house here at home, we are hardly going to be able to be good examples for around the world. But the uh, obvious uh, uh, activity uh, that we're pursuing uh, in Saudi Arabia right now, I think uh, no matter what kind of justifications by the president for national security interests, whatever that is, I say that for national security interests, we ought to bring all those troops home. I jotted down a, a, a few points I'd like to make on those things that I think are important that might help us in promoting libertarian ideas. The, the positive side of the libertarian message that the average American should respond to us. And then I want to talk a little bit about why we have problems, because obviously we're having problems. I mean, the country is not libertarian. And uh, we still have a long way to go. And uh, the message is right. We all know that. So maybe there's something wrong with our delivery. First point I want to make is that uh, I think it's important that we emphasize to non-libertarians that our philosophy is based on a moral principle. They, a lot of people say, well, libertarians are too philosophic. They have too much concern about a principle. Well, everybody has a principle. It's just whether it's a good principle or a bad principle. Interventionism and inflationism and socialism, they're all principles. They happen to be uh, principles we don't believe in. But we have a moral principle. We believe it's the correct moral principle. It's certainly a moral principle that the American people have been comfortable with. It has to do with the individual. It's the emphasis that the individual is important. And this is compatible with most religious beliefs in this country, that the individual is key, that the individual has rights, has natural rights or God-given rights, and the individual is very important. I believe if we can convince people that we start there, it'll be very helpful in presenting the other program. Because those words aren't antagonistic, they're not threatening. There are views that the American people generally endorse anyway. They believe in God-given rights. They believe that uh, the Creator uh, gave us our rights. It's written into our Declaration of Independence. And people are very comfortable and, and feel that the individual should be important. They do get confused when it comes to making people better and making the economy better. But that basic principle, if we accept that where we start, we can lead into the others. Another principle that we're all familiar with, I think, should be emphasized to non-libertarians. And that is that we're not aggressive. We're, we have uh, sometimes an aggressive nature about what we believe in, which at times can come across negative. But we as individuals do not promote and we condemn aggression. We believe people shouldn't initiate force, that people shouldn't be hurting other people, and they shouldn't be stealing and, and uh, hurting and killing. And this, of course, is something, how can anybody reject this? That this is a wonderful idea that people are non-aggressive. And uh, I think that one way I've turned this around a little bit with some liberals when it comes to the issue of guns. Liberals, you know, say that you do not have the right to own a weapon to defend yourself. And conservatives say, obviously you do. You do have a right to it. And uh, the conservatives are so good, they don't even want your gun registered. They just want to register your kids. <laughs> but the um, liberal, although he's, she is absolutely opposed to you owning a gun, they are very generous with the use of the gun by the government. They, everything they talk about is with the assumption that the government's gun is going to enforce what they think is the best for society. So whether it's a regulation or a tax or a war or whatever, the gun of the IRS or some agency. And we're even at a point now, one time before I left Washington, I left all 
all the agencies that were permitted to carry guns. And it's, it includes the IRS and OSHA inspectors and EPA inspectors and certainly Secret Service and CIA and, and FBI. I mean, there's a lot of agencies of government that are permitted the use of the gun. And, of course, if they're doing things immoral and unconstitutional, the liberal really is the individual who promotes uh, uh, the idea that you can't own the gun, but the government can, I think is a very dangerous idea. Another approach to presenting libertarian ideas is to present it in the context of our history, American traditions and the Constitution. Now, we, we know the Constitution certainly had uh, many shortcomings, but it happens to have been, uh, although now ignored, a, rather, a, a relatively good document when you compare it to the rest of the documents around the world. And therefore, if, uh, if we pursue this from the original intent and the way the Constitution was written and what was intended by government, we're on pretty safe grounds. Now, many of you will recall the name uh, Larry McDonald. Larry McDonald was not a libertarian. Matter of fact, he had some negative things to say about libertarians. But he was a constitutionalist. And it was not unusual while we were there that he and I would vote together. But he was a principled person, and he approached it from the Constitution. And if there came up a project, something like uh, voting federal aid for the uh, uh, treatment and the cure of diabetes, how can you be opposed to that? Then every once in a while, Dr. McDonald and Dr. Paul was voting up there with the, the, with the uh, superficial appearance that they don't even care. But obviously, he was coming at it from a different viewpoint. So there's no reason in the world why we can't utilize that and say that, yes, our viewpoints aren't new and strange and bizarre and radical. Ours are very conventional. They're constitutional. They're part of the American tradition. We're not the radicals. The radicals are the ones who are in charge in Washington today. Another point is emphasizing, and presidents in recent years have used this, emphasize voluntarism. Kennedy did it, Reagan did it, Bush did it, they all do. They like the idea. Of course, they don't want to depend on voluntarism. They want to use it, but the lingo, the rhetoric was very libertarian. Certainly Ronald Reagan was able to pick up a lot of our rhetoric and use it and even become associated with some libertarians, although uh, he certainly did not follow through with any libertarian views. But volunteerism is important. People like volunteerism. They like to be kind and considerate and help out. And uh, along with this is tolerance, tolerance of other people's views. I don't think if you took a poll among the American people and say, do you think the American people should be tolerant or intolerant of, of their neighbors? Well, most people say, well, we should be tolerant. Well, when they accept that as a fact, then we have to push them a little bit further in saying, well, tolerance means that you accept them even when they do things or say things or read things that you might not like or do or we do yourselves. So tolerance is a little bit more than just something that you give lip service to. And uh, I believe this is the uh, way to capture the idea of goodwill. Uh, I, I think if, uh, if we don't portray ourselves as having concern and want to portray goodwill, then uh, it would be more difficult and is more difficult for us to sell the ideas. Libertarian philosophy and libertarian uh, positions have influenced me a whole lot. And in one area in particular, of course, I started off mainly with the economic issues, moved in studying economics and Mises and the other Austrian economists. But then the next step was really in foreign policy. Uh, there was certainly a time when uh, I wondered why we were doing all these things around the world. But then, as I said before, I was taught in public school why we had to do these things. And then it was later on that I realized that we didn't need to be doing these things around the world. And not only is it a better position, not only is it a constitutional position, but if we would do a lot less sooner, we would have a better chance for peace. The American people want peace. 
Yes, 80% right now are cheering Ronald Reagan on, but they don't know there might be somebody get killed, and they might not know there's going to be a war. And maybe they will have a second thought later on, but they have nothing else to offer. Then nobody else is offering another opinion. I was flying over on the airplane yesterday from Houston, and uh, the gentleman next to me struck up a conversation because he saw my name on some uh, on an envelope. And uh, he, uh, thanks to Jim Perrin, he says, oh, yeah, he says, I know Ron Paul for president because I see that sign down in San Francisco. And uh, so he, uh, we got to talking, and I asked, I wanted his opinion. I wanted to see what he was thinking about the Mideast. He says, well, I can see both sides. You know, he says, I see that is, there's some risk, but I see the necessity of going in, you know. But then he immediately followed up, and he says, what do you think? And um, he was really looking for information. I mean, he was more or less starved for it. And it was all acknowledgement. You know, he said, yeah, that's right, that's right, that's right. But has he heard the, our view on television? No, our view doesn't get on television very often. And uh, yet it makes a whole lot of sense. And the American people, if they realize that long-term peace is better achieved with our policy than with the policy pursued by all the administration this century, they will come to us. They're convinced that it's in American national interest and, we're, and for world peace for us to send a quarter of million men uh, halfway around the world to jeopardize the lives of American citizens and soldiers and, uh, of course, everything else that uh, might follow. But uh, the emphasis on peace, I think, should be uh, something we should uh, not forget about. The libertarian principle accepts two traditional uh, uh, principles that have been known for uh, thousands of years. And they're basic, they're fundamental, they're in civilization, they're in our major religions. And yet they're key to the libertarian philosophy. And that is the recognition that uh, life and property are important. We know that we as libertarians cannot initiate force. We can't hurt people and we can't steal from them. Their property is very important. And along with that is if you have the market process working, you ought to have a strong respect for voluntary contract, contractual arrangements. And if you agree to do something, you do it. And if there is a role for government, it would be in this very narrow sense to making sure that people do fulfill their obligations and not cheat and steal and defraud. Now, these, these sound so basic, and yet they're so important if they're carried through to the ultimate end. But these are not new ideas. Uh, I mean, you can go to the Ten Commandments, uh, thou shalt not kill and thou shalt not steal. And obviously they're embedded. And the idea that you do what you say is part of the libertarian philosophy and something really, if put in the proper context, people cannot deny. And yet today we have government interfering with voluntary con contracts on a daily basis. There's really no such thing in this country that really can be construed as a voluntary contract because they're telling us everything what we, that we have to do in our economic and our uh, social uh, lives. Another area that I think we're, we come down on the short end and probably the most difficult for libertarians uh, and where we get the, the most grief on and we get the most negative publicity and that is the social acceptability. The People that I know who are non-libertarians who just know a little bit about libertarians, I'm not saying that criticism is justified, but it's there. You can't deny it's there. They will come and say, oh, yeah, libertarians, they're the ones who like pornography, prostitution, gambling, and drugs, and you're associating with them. <laughs> But if that's the selling point, let me tell you that you can't sell it. <laughs> Obviously, you can't sell it because even if the even if 90% of the American people endorse that, they don't want to be known to endorse it. <laughs> so they won't publicly endorse you if you endorse it. So 90% of the American people are very, very cautious on what they publicly endorse. So if you're in the arena of politics, then you have to be careful not to be construed that you're endorsing any of these things that we certainly tolerate. And I think that is one of the major problems that we have if I had to judge from the many, many conservative and liberal friends that I have outside of the, of the libertarian uh, uh, movement. Libertarian philosophy also should be sold for another very, very important reason. A lot of what I said here 
a lot of people would write off and say, well, this is theoretical, and uh, it's not all that practical, and it sounds fine, but we're in the nitty-gritty real world, and we want to do something. I mean, we have to take care of the people. But we as libertarians have to be convinced, just as Bob uh, Smith earlier and, and others have talked about uh, the environment, we have to come up with programs as libertarians to do something about it. We have to be the most practical pro, uh, pa, uh, party, and, the, and we have to have the most practical ideas. We have to convince the American people that it's impractical. The world's now becoming to, is coming to recognize that socialism is very impractical. At one time, they thought forced redistribution of wealth was a good idea, and it was very practical. And it took away a little from the wealthy and gave more to the poor, and everybody was going to be happy. Well, that's very impractical, and we're seeing the results. It's too bad they didn't listen to Mises in 1920, and they wouldn't have wasted so much time and energy and suffering uh, to recognize this. But we have to be convinced that uh, it is practical. It's, it's practical both in the social moral sense as well as in the uh, uh, foreign policy sense of more peace and certainly in the economic sense. If we want prosperity, we have to have a free market. And therefore, we as a group have to ask ourselves, what have we been doing? If we have such a wonderful philosophy and it's based on American tradition, it's based on some of the good elements of many religions, and it's practical, and it's the philosophy that provides peace and prosperity, why aren't, why aren't we doing better? Uh, why, why don't we have more people in office? Why don't we have more influence in the media? Why don't we have more influence in Congress? Well, I think we're getting more, and I think we're making progress, but I, I still think we come up short in coming across in a positive way. But I think there's also some other reasons, too. I think the opposition uh, has had some, uh, some advantages, especially if we or they or us, we live in a country that is rather prosperous. And the prosperity has been accumulated at a time when we were more libertarian. And great prosperity, it may take a while to ruin prosperity. It may take a while uh, to destroy capital. But we've been doing a pretty good job at it for these last 40 or 50 years. And we are now facing a crisis in this country. The capital has been consumed. The value of the dollar has been undermined. The basis of our freedoms have been uh, undermined as well. Uh, privacy is a major issue. If I had to pick one issue that my subscribers are most interested in, it's privacy. And they're not all libertarians. They're probably half aren't libertarians, but they're interested in privacy. Of course, financial privacy and other type of privacy, but privacy ought to be the same. And it ought to be synonymous with liberty. But the, um, the, the opposition has certainly uh, some advantages. The one advantage they have with this prosperous society is the advantage of uh, playing the role of Santa Claus or Robin Hood. And uh, the American people sort of succumb to the temptation. Uh, there is always a temptation among men to uh, receive, the, uh, receive goods and services uh, with less than full effort. That temptation will exist uh, uh, throughout uh, the history of man has and will. But the, the demagogue, uh, the redistributionist, is very prone to jump on this and grab the wealth and redistribute it, place Santa Claus and say, I care. I really care about the people. They care about their power, but when they're selling their message, they get up and they say, I care about you. Ron Paul over there wouldn't even have food stamps. He doesn't care about poor people. He wants them to starve in the street. Not realizing that there are more poor people, more homeless, and more starving people ever since they've been doing all this wonderful redistribution of wealth. But that has yet been proven. The the do-gooder is still riding the high moral ground of saying he's compassionate and he cares. The conservative does it in the same way on the social issue. The, so, the conservative says, do you want to live in a society where they gamble and drink and there's prostitution, all these horrible things? Oh, no, we're going to make the people better. And we have this high moral code that we're going to impose on the people. So they grab the moral high ground, and for that reason... Most people in this country are conservatives and liberals. And yet we have to dispel that myth, myth, obviously, and convert many of them to believing that it is better to uh, accept a, another, another philosophy. 
we, um, we have to deliver the message in a concerned, uh, compassionate way. Uh, if we do this and the people get interested, it doesn't have to be, and it shouldn't be, in a self-sacrificial way. Yes, we want to be compassionate, we want to be concerned, we want to believe in free choices and tolerance because we think it will make a better world. We think people will be better because they make their own choices rather than coerced uh, by, uh, by government. We believe there will be more prosperity. And therefore, the individual, the American citizen who's making the decision has to make the decision based on self-interest. It doesn't have to be <coughs> on self-sacrifice and say, well, I'm going to make a lot of money, but I realize that I have to give so much of the money away to the poor in order for a libertarian society to work. No, we don't have to concentrate on that. That can be the role of the minister. If they believe that tithing is good and that you should help your fellow man, that's a personal decision. And it should not be a political decision. Because even if nobody donated anything and everybody was a self-serving, narrow libertarian that consumed and used it only for themselves, the world would still be a lot better off. The, the world would certainly be a lot better off under, under those uh, uh, circumstances, uh, but politically we're better off if we can come across as being compassionate and concerned. I personally endorse a philosophy that says that I do have obligations and uh, I, I believe in family care, community care, and I believe that we should do it. I think Libertarians, the libertarian philosophy has a greater chance if more of us do have voluntary compassion and are willing enough to contribute in a voluntary way. But I think this is very important, obviously. Eisenhower made a statement once I think is interesting, and I'll go ahead and conclude. I think there may be a few minutes left for questions. Eisenhower made a statement. He said, you know, he, get, he got a lot of criticism for not standing up and being an ultra-conservative, an ultra-liberal, and he admitted he walked down the straight and narrow middle road. He says, that takes courage. He says, because I'm getting knocked down by both sides, and he says, it's not easy to walk down the middle of the road. And when you think about this, Eisenhower was seen as a moderate. There are many moderates around. But what, what is a moderate? A moderate is the opposite of a libertarian. A moderate tries to coalesce and bring people together by saying, well, yes, I'm going to accept military interventionism, and I'm going to accept social interventionism and welfare. And they get them, bring them together, and of course they get criticized by both, and, uh, and yet that's generally the way the world has marched on, uh, by accepting both sides of government intervention. And uh, we become more of a statist, a totalitarian society. My suggestion is this. Obviously, for us to have the appearance of bringing people together, to coming together, not to be off in some strange hinterland where people think we're strange and different and they don't understand us, but to say, yes, we're working in the middle, but we're going to bring people together for the right reasons. We're going to bring the conservatives over here because they believe in free enterprise, and we're going to bring the liberal over here because they believe in civil liberties. Bring them together and think about how this can be a positive uh, move instead of a, a negative move. I think if we can do this and we continue our efforts, we will be successful. Education really is number one on the list. We must educate ourselves and our youngsters and our people so that eventually we have influence in the media and in the government. And then, uh, of course, second, uh, then we go into political action. The political action is a consequence of a consensus of the people. I myself like to think that I participate in both, by both being involved in political action for the sense of, uh, uh, of uh, arousing interest and alerting people to other ideas, as well as pursuing the educational uh, efforts that so many have been doing for so many years. And I think if we continue in this line, that we will have a successful libertarian revolution in this country. Thank you very much.
endorse that concept. I think uh, it is the malpractice uh, problem in medicine is a, is a major problem and it's also in other many other areas of litigation. But uh, it should be done with the least amount of legislation by the acceptance of, a, of the principle of voluntary contracts. Today, if I contract with my patient, that we will settle the dispute in such and such manner, whether they would go as far as that and saying they won't sue, they might accept uh, an arbitration panel, uh, they're, they're thrown out of court. They're not allowed to sign those, uh, and it's, it's considered that they've signed away their inalienable rights and uh, therefore they're not legal. But I would accept the, uh, your notion. I think there would be, uh, the filler would be insurance. I think in uh, malpractice, if the patient came around to finding which physician they can get the best contract with, and then if they don't have complete coverage, if there's a major catastrophe, then uh, there should be uh, flight insurance or surgical insurance that would cover this. Project. Will you be running for office again? And either way, how can we assist you? <laughs> 1988 was a long, long year. <laughs> and I'm still recovering, and I'm not thinking right now at all about running for anything. Uh, my current project, of course, is trying to put together 13 cable-type libertarian programs. We have seven. We've been on the air. We will get back on the air again in the fall, and hopefully we'll have all 13 because that's a season. And each time we move, we get a better station. So I'm going to work real hard on trying to, trying to reach more people. I, I, I have a strong belief that if we don't get into the electronic media, we're not going to reach more than the smaller groups that we have uh, at meetings like this. So you, you could help me by uh, uh, encouraging my television, uh, but uh, someday, maybe down the road, I might consider, but not right now. <laughs> Would you like to talk about Nancy Lord? Me? Okay, he asked me if I would talk about Nancy Lord. Nancy Lord, you know, is running for mayor in Washington, D.C. Uh, she was very grateful that she uh, uh, raised a decent sum of money uh, with a letter that I signed uh, for a mayor's race. She did quite well. And uh, I don't know, I don't keep up with the, you know, the race in Washington on a day-to-day -day basis, but everything I hear has been very encouraging. Last week, or, yeah, I think it was last week, they had, you know, a grand opening of the campaign, uh, and uh, I notified her that I would be going up there next week. So let's hope that she does real well, uh, and that would give us a good boost. Yeah, next time, we're to send mercenary army to the Saudi Arabia. No. Did everybody hear the question? Uh, he asked, would I object to Exxon sending their army to the Persian Gulf to protect their property interests? And I have no objection. Just so they don't use my kids or my money. We'll take one more and I think we'll have to quit. Is that it, Vince? Well, you indicated that uh, over the last 50 years you think that we've been living off or reducing our capital stock, but uh, most of the economic data would seem to indicate the contrary. Personal income adjusted for inflation is up widely, perhaps four times. Personal wealth is up. Capital stock is up. Could you tell us why you believe that we can uh, diminish well, our capital stock? I, I think our standard of living is, is down. I think we are less capable of producing steel and other things in this country than we have ever, ever been. Uh, certainly one source of soundness to an economy would be the soundness of a currency, and we have a very uh, weak currency. There's really no true savings in this country. Savings represents capital, not the Federal Reserve and what they do with the printing press. So, so I, I see that we 
have been drifting into an anti-capitalistic system where we aren't producing and saving. We are consuming and borrowing. So I think uh, what some of these figures that the government may report is a reflection of the fact that we were able uh, for now, borrow money at a cheap rate and took a little pressure off the Federal Reserve, and therefore it looks like income has uh, has gone up. But uh, I don't think the American people, uh, as a whole, are a lot better off. I believe the liberal statistics that show that uh, there are more people in the poor category and more people in the streets than there was than there were 10, 15 years ago. So I see our nation as poor and less capable of producing and uh, have a dangerous amount of debt. Okay. Well, oh, that's a good question. Are there any closet libertarians in the Congress? Uh, <laughs> Not in, not in the true sense of the word, but uh, one thing I meant to mention at the opening, and I didn't I didn't uh, mention was that the liber the congressmen came to be very respectful of the message, and they would frequently come to me and say, you know, what is the libertarian message? And many of them had a guilt complex and would come and sit down. Mickey Edwards, being one in particular, would sit down and say, you know, if they had been introduced to the ideas, they know it's a good thing. And I say, you know, I'm really a libertarian. I'd like to vote with you, but the heat's too strong for me at home. So they got around to the point where it was always a positive to say you were a libertarian, but uh, they they like they would like to be libertarians, uh, but they're politically they don't have the courage uh, to be. Uh, if there happened to be a um, one of these. Uh, uh, statistical analysis, a voting record, if an individual who would not generally be associated with uh, a so-called conservative Republican would all of a sudden rank high, which was a more libertarian uh, uh, analysis, they would be very delighted to come and say, hey, look at this, you know, I'm right with you. Like, you know, I'm really a good guy, but I just can't quite do this because my people, he, they don't, they don't, they feel obligated that they cannot come with a an opinion. Their job is to reflect, you know, the majority vote in their district. And they say that I have to suppress these urges to be a principled person. <laughs> and what, what, they're, what they're really arguing, though, is that uh, uh, whoever's given the most money, they better reflect their views because they never really take a vote of the people. <laughs> Thank you very much.